Good morning. Good morning. It is good to see all of you here today. I could just go home now. I've already been blessed enough just to have Ralph and Coach Reeves back with us. Johnny's doing good. We have a lot of good news to share in our congregation today, and we just, it's just been a blessing just to be here and, and just to see each other and to be together. Um, thank you for coming, and thank you for being here and being a part of this day. It is my hope. It is always my prayer. But as we come together, God will speak to you, that you will hear him speak to you through his words, and through the words that are spoken, those that are sung. We want to welcome everyone who is also joining with us today through the through the radio or the TV or whatever form of media you may be joining in with us. And again, our hope and our prayer is the same for you. As we gather together, we hope that God speaks to your hearts as well and that he strengthens you for the mission that is ahead of you. He strengthens you in your love and relationship with him. Thank you all uh, for coming and thank you all for being a part of this morning service. Thank you, Brother Steve. I think you may need these right here. We're going to get back into worship service and song this morning. Our first hymn this morning is hymn number 369. We're going to be singing out of the Methodist hymnal this morning. Let's all stand and sing Blessed Assurance. We're going to sing all verses. you to remain standing. We're going to have our affirmation of faith this morning. It's in your bulletin or it's on page 885 in your Methodist hymnal. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father Almighty, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and 
may be seated. Our next hymn is hymn number 384. You know, I forgot to mention what during our prayer time this morning, we want to pray for all the folks that, uh, you know, lost a lot of things in the damage of the tornadoes over at Goat Island and Walnut and other communities. And uh, of course, right here in Tishomingo County, a lot of the folks had a lot of damage over there. So let's pray for those families. And also, I'd got a message just before church, Scotty Young, the pastor down at Way of Life in Tishomingo, his wife's dad passed away and he wanted us to remember uh, that family in your prayers this morning. So, all right, you ready for Love's Divine, uh, number 384. <laughs> At this time, we're going to have our ushers come at this time to receive this morning's regular offering, and that'll be followed by our building fund offering this morning.
Our last hymn this morning before we turn it over to Brother Steve for this morning's message is going to be hymn number 261. A little change. 261. morning, if you'd like to join with me in our reading, I'll be reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 17. I'll be reading the entire chapter. John, chapter 17, verses 1 through 26. John 17, verses 1 through 26. John 17, verses 1 through 26. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may, be glor may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, 
that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have, not, they have known all the things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and they, know, they have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they may also be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have declared to them your name and will declare it, that, they love, that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his words. Richard Gribble tells this old Hebrew parable. Once there was a village chief who had three sons. Each one of his sons possessed a special talent. The oldest son was skilled in his ability to raise and to care for the olive trees. The second was a shepherd. But when the sheep got sick, he possessed special abilities to, to make them well. The third son was a great dancer. When there was a string of bad luck in his family or in the village or if anyone needed some, some cheer added to their lives, he would dance and he would bring them joy. One day the father told his sons that he must go on a, a long journey. He instructed them, my sons, the people of the village will be depending upon you to help them. Each of you have a special talent so while I am gone, I expect you to use your gifts wisely and well so that upon my, my return, I will find that our village is more happy and prosperous than the day I left. He embraced his sons, and he left on his journey. For a few months, things went quite well in the village. But then came the cold winter with its snow and its winds and its assorted problems. First, the buds of the olive trees shrank and cracked, and it would be therefore a very long time before the trees could ever produce or recover. The village, because of the extremely long winter, suddenly ran out of firewood, so the people began to cut down the trees, and in the process they stripped the village bare. Even the first son did not want to see the trees cut down. He knew the villagers needed the heat to survive, and so he began to, to help them make firewood out of, out of the olive trees he'd always taken care of. Then the snow and ice made it impossible for the traders to come and bring food up the river and negotiate through the mountain passes. So the villagers said, let us kill the sheep and eat them so that we will not starve to death through the winter. 
The villager's second son refused for a time, but eventually he gave in to the villager's demands. He said, what good is it to spare the sheep only to have all of my villagers perish? In this way, the villagers had just enough firewood for their fires and enough food for their tables. But the horrible winter had broken the people's spirit. They began to think about that things were really much worse than what they were, and, and they began to lose hope. The belief was so strong that family after family began to desert the village in search of a more hospitable environment. As spring came, the grip of winter began to loosen, and at the same time, the chief of the village returned home to find that there was smoke rising only out of his own chimney. What have you done? he asked as he reached the village. What has happened to the, to the villagers? Oh, Father, forgive me, said the eldest son. The people were freezing and begged me to, to cut down the olive tree, so I did, and I gave away all that I had. I am no longer fit to be the orchard keeper. Don't be angry, Father, said the second son. The sheep, the sheep would have frozen anyway, and the people were starving, and thus I sent the herd to slaughter so that they all might have food to eat. Father understood and said, Don't be ashamed, my sons. You did the best you could, and you acted rightly, and you acted humanely. You used your talents wisely in trying to save the people. But tell me, what has become of them? Where are they? Where have they gone? The two older brothers fixed their eyes on the younger brother, who said, Welcome home, Father. Yes, it's, it's been a hard winter. There was little to eat and, and little firewood for heat. I thought it would be insensitive and improper to dance during such suffering. Besides, I, I needed to conserve my energy and my strength so I could dance for you when you came home. Then dance, my son, said the father, for the village is empty and so too now is my heart. Fill us with joy and courage once again. Yes, please dance. But when the third son made ready to dance, he grimaced and he fell to the floor. His legs were so stiff and sore from sitting that they were no longer useful for dancing. The father was so sad he, he could not even be angry. He simply said to the youngest son, ours was a strong village that could have survived for want of fuel and food, but it could never survive without hope because you fell to use your talent wisely and well. Our people gave up what little hope they had. The village is deserted and now you are crippled. Today marks our first Sunday in the season of Lent. It is time, the time of year as Christians that we are each called upon to look upon ourselves. To look into our lives and into our hearts. To give an accounting of our strengths and our weaknesses, our victories and our failings. Oftentimes when folks think of Lent, and this period of self-examination. We think that it is more a time to examine our sins or, or our sinful ways. But Lent is a lot more than just about our sins. It's also about asking. Have we done our best? Are we doing our best? Are we giving our best to God? Both as individuals and collectively as a church. Our lives may not be terribly controlled by sin. It is also a time of asking, have we have we done what we're supposed to do? But, but that will not always mean that we have arrived or that we have got it all together as Christians. It's more than an accounting of whether or not we've stayed out of trouble with God. There is a life to live. There are words to say, a testimony on our lips that we are called to as well. 
Those things. Those things need as much attention as anything else in our lives. Our passage today is a very powerful and meaningful passage. The story, uh, uh, around the story, is that Jesus is, is headed to the cross. He's come to a time when he is fully aware that his suffering and death are, are at hand. The Passover meal, the last supper, is complete. In just moments, the world will begin to do its thing. It will begin to do all that it has in its power to destroy him. As Jesus is praying, there is, there is a beating and nails and a cross and a spear and suffering immediately before him. The time was here. The moment he was born for was at hand. But Jesus is able, before all the events begin to take place, he is able to take time to pray. In his words, it is not difficult to hear the struggle he himself was in. A struggle that would take everything from him that he had. Christ said he had been faithful to our Father. So faithful he could speak the words that probably none of the others of us could speak. Father, I have glorified you on earth, he said. I have finished the work that you have given me to do. Father, I have manifested your name. I have taught them what you wanted taught. Jesus was able to say to our Father in heaven, I have done all that you wanted. I've given you all that I have. I've given them all that you wanted me to give them. I have fulfilled the purpose that you have called me to. This that is a powerful testimony from Christ about himself. A, a scriptural moment in which Jesus is, is looking and examining all that he has done and all that he has said while he was on this earth. Every motive, every purpose he had in his ministry to the world and to his people, he has looked inward at them. And he is confident. He is confident that he has served his father exactly as the father has asked him to do. There lay ahead of him, however, the last effort. The last effort that would make everything real and purposeful. There before him, there in his own sight, was the cross, the crucifixion, and his death. That is what Christ faced while he proclaimed his loyalty to God and God's desires. Lent brings us to a moment, to a moment in which we must ask Have I done the same? Can we say we have done all that God has asked of us? Have we done our best for the Christ who gave so much and our God who would let his own son perish to redeem us when we are not at our best? Have we given, have we done our best that we can do for him? Yes, Lent calls us to much. Many years ago now, I had the opportunity to play football at Belmont High School. I had two fine coaches, one who I'm privileged to be his pastor to date, I must say. As a young man, during the years that I played football, I was inspired by those who led, led us to give it my best when I stepped out onto that field. There was a philosophy among us at the time that I have to tell you has pretty well stuck with me all of my life. As best I, I recall, and I think I recall it pretty well, they never demanded to win. Winning was the product of doing one thing. We understood, as we should, that when we took the field, what mattered more than anything else was that we gave it our best effort. 
that we leave it all on the field. I cannot remember a time when we ever ran extra sprints for losing the game unless that loss came because we knew we had not given our best effort. We won games we weren't supposed to win. and We lost a few that we should have won. But what really mattered at the end of the day, win or lose, did you leave it all on the field? Did you do the best you could do? That philosophy stayed with me as I coached Little League Baseball. I enjoyed the kids. I loved the competition. You're going to find out I'm a very competitive kind of guy. Just ask Jacob about ping pong. He'll tell you. I, I love competition. I still enjoy seeing those boys who, who to this very day still refer to me as Coach Steve or, or Coach Kennedy. Had a bunch of them take my class, and I just loved it every time they said it. There were two things we talked about that summer. The first was to do our best, to be as perfect as we could on the defensive side of the baseball game. Don't worry about winning the games, I would tell them. Worry about giving them away. The second one was this. We would pray. We would pray before every game, but our prayer was never to win. Our prayer was always to ask the Lord to help us be the best we could be on the field that day. We never asked for no more than that. We came up one game short of the playoffs, going to state. But we had a wonderful year, doing the best we could and leaving it all on the field. The God you serve, the God you love, wants to know, are we willing to do the same? Jesus needs us to do the same. He did. He gave his best. He gave his all. He gave everything in words and deeds and testimony and suffering and, and sacrifice. He gave everything he had. The success of the Christian mission lay in his willingness to give all that he had for the cause and purpose that God had given him. And now it all rests in our hands. The future of our faith has been handed off to us. Christ knew it would come to this. He knew he needed those who would believe in him in order to perpetuate the faith. That was his prayer. So yes, everything matters. Giving your best to the one who gave his best for you is all that matters. There is simply no way to, to overstate it or overemphasize it or even to overpreach it. So we must ask ourselves, are we leaving everything we have on the field for Christ? The truth is, Christ needs us. He needs us to carry his story and his name into the ages. He needs us to engage in ministry while we engage the world. He needs us all to, to be witnesses of his words, his life to all peoples and all places. All that you know of Christ, everything that he's ever done for you, is important for the world to know and to see. He has given so much of himself. Can any of us here say that he's asking for too much? No, we don't need to cherish his promises for ourselves. We all need to use whatever it is that we have to glorify Christ and, and God who gave him to us. Jesus would like for it to be our best effort to do our best for him in this life, in this time, and in this world that we're living in. It is Lent. It is time to look into and at our lives. We must examine ourselves. 
We need to answer these questions. Have I left all I have on the field for Christ who left all of it out there for me? Can the world see Christ in me and all that I say and do? Can the world see Christ in me? Am I giving my best for the one who gave his best to me? If you can't say yes, then it's time to repent. To ask God to forgive you. To ask God to give you renewed strength and purpose. To ask God to give you strength and a chance to dance again. Our closing here. The altar is open to you for anybody who would like to come for anything that you need. The altar is always open to you. Please feel free to come at this time. Our hymn is hymn number 898 for our benediction song. Once again, hymn number 898. Actually, I'm sorry, 467, 467. Let's stand. Trust and obey. We'll do the first and fourth verse, 467. you